So the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Please join me for our call to worship. In the kingdom of God, weakness becomes strength. Emptiness is filled to overflowing. Fear grows into courage. The great are humbled, and the humbled are lifted up. In God's steadfast love, all things are made whole. Let us worship God together. Oh, 
Oh God, we come this morning seeking to be filled with your unquenchable spirit. We come with open hearts, ready to rekindle the gift of God within us. We know that you will meet us in our searching. And so we enter into your presence with lively anticipation in Jesus' name. Amen. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Let us confess our sins to the one who searches us and knows our hearts, first silently and then by joining together in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Gracious and all-knowing God, you made us in your image with a mind to know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. But our knowledge is incomplete, our love is inconsistent, and our actions fall short of our intentions. Forgive our dimness of vision, our lack of commitment, and our failure to remember and appreciate your works of faithfulness and mercy. Make us patient in our trials, confident of your love, and joyful in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God's love is steadfast, and God's faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise God that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Hi, boys and girls. I wanna tell you a story about my grandma. When she was 95 years old, I said, Mama Faye, you look amazing. How do you feel? And she said, when I sit down, I feel great. I feel like I'm 27 years old, but when I stand up, that's when I feel my age because I have all these aches and pains. Imagine living like that. The woman from our Bible story today knew that exact feeling. She was bent over. She couldn't stand up straight and I'm sure she was always in pain. But Jesus healed her because that's who Jesus is. He sees people, he sees their needs and he cares for them. He does the same thing for us in his timing and in his way. So know that sometimes when we're not feeling great, we can always turn to Jesus because he'll always be there to love us and help us. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for you and your healing powers. When we are not feeling our best, remind us that you're always there and you help us. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Listen for the word of our Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up and started praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. 
For Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus was speaking in the synagogue on the Sabbath and just then appeared a woman who had been crippled for 18 years. She was bent over and unable to stand up straight which means that for 18 years, she had seen only feet, not faces. No longer could she draw water from the well or have conversations face to face with friends and family. She couldn't do her daily chores or worship God in the same way other women could. And because of her infirmity, everybody assumed that her sin had caused her condition. When Jesus saw her, he called her and said, woman, you're set free from your ailment. And then he laid his hands on her. Immediately, she stood up straight and began to praise God. Everyone gasped, but for all the wrong reasons, not because this woman was cured on the spot, but because it was the Sabbath day and Sabbath law forbid any work to be done. The leader of the synagogue pointed to Jesus and repeated over and over to the worshipers, there are six days on which work ought to be done, but not on the Sabbath. Surely you know that, Rabbi, don't you? But Jesus had his own way of viewing the situation. He said, don't you untie your ox or donkey on the Sabbath to lead them to water? And shouldn't this woman a daughter of Abraham, who's been bound for 18 long years, be set free this day from her bondage. What he said made sense and everyone knew it. So the entire crowd began to rejoice at what Jesus had done, except, of course, the religious leaders. The synagogue leader, I suspect, wasn't just a legalist. I think he was obtuse. I think he genuinely didn't realize the hypocrisy in his judgment of Jesus, at least not at first. It reminds me of an old episode of MASH in which the perpetually squirrely and dim-witted Major Burns kept squealing anonymously on all of his comrades. But when the fingers start to point to him as the culprit, he claims he's innocent. Through a series of verbal give and takes between Burns and Colonel Potter, Burns gets backed into a corner. Potter asks him, so why'd you do it? Burns responds, I thought it was my patriotic duty. I thought you said you didn't do it, Colonel Potter retorts. I thought I did too, is Burns' sheepish response. And he stands convicted. In other words, the leaders of the synagogue stood convicted and they didn't see a way out. Once the leader took a stance in his mind, he needed to stand his ground. There was too much pride at stake to retract his condemnation of Jesus. And from his perspective, his job was to lead the Jewish people. So how would it look if he agreed with him? And how could he keep control of the synagogue if he admitted his error. And so he does nothing. But it's a turning point in Jesus' ministry. The crowds begin to flock to him, wanting to hear what he has to say, wanting to be part of this new and less rigid way of worshiping and following God. And of course, the religious leaders don't. The last thing they want is for somebody else to come along and tell them the way that they should be running the synagogue or the way they should be teaching scripture or enforcing or interpreting Jewish law. In their minds, there was only one way for them to maintain their control, and that was to get rid of Jesus altogether. And it sets in motion his arrest and trial in the months to come. The truth is, despite the leader's accusation, Jesus isn't doing anything to minimize the holiness of God in the synagogue, nor is he minimizing the importance of keeping the Sabbath day holy. In fact, he claims this woman's healing is a Sabbath act. Sabbath means rest and liberation, 
not only for God's people, but even for an ox or a donkey that Jesus mentions. So his argument goes from the lesser to the greater. If you're prepared to work on the Sabbath to lead your donkey and your ox to water, surely you can liberate this woman from her physical impairment. Plus, the Sabbath is a reminder to the Jewish people of the Exodus, the release from Egyptian bondage. Just as they were slaves in Egypt, this woman is enslaved by her body. Her healing is a sign of the new kingdom that Jesus has ushered in. Her healing honors the Sabbath. It doesn't diminish it. But Jesus' argument falls on deaf ears. And often that's the case with religious norms or any other norms, for that matter, once they're challenged. In 2015, 65 million people had been displaced from their homes as a result of conflict or natural disaster. More than a million refugees entered Europe after fleeing wars in the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia. And that summer, the International Olympic Committee, the IOC and guardian of the Olympic Games, helped international aid agencies integrate refugees into various sports. They established a refugee emergency fund, raised $1.9 million to help the athletes who'd been displaced. The same year, the IOC invited the refugee athletes to compete in the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro. The decision was controversial. Shouldn't members of the Olympic team represent their home country? And shouldn't they be living in their country in order to qualify? But the IOC said no, not if they can't live there safely. One of the athletes who competed was a woman by the name of Yusra Mardini. Her home was destroyed by a bomb and she and her sister Sarah decided to flee to a refugee camp at the insistence of their parents. The parents remained in Syria, but they made their way through Lebanon and Turkey before getting into a small boat with 18 other refugees and headed for Greece. The boat was built for seven occupants. Its motor failed under the weight. It began to take on water 15 minutes after leaving the Turkish coast on a dinghy that the smugglers had provided, the boat's engine seized. The waves were raging. The boat was sinking despite everyone tossing everything they could overboard because the boat was only designed for seven people. It couldn't bear the weight. Yesra and Sarah climbed out into the cold water to help keep the boat steady. They swam for three hours in the open sea and pulled the boat with ropes towards the Greek island of Lesbos. Two other refugees helped them. Yesra said, we used our legs and one arm each. We held the rope with the other. We kicked and kicked. Waves kept coming, hitting me in the eye, Yesra remembers. And that was the hardest part, she said, the stinging of the salt water. But what were we going to do? Let everyone drown? We pulled and swam for our lives. Everyone survived. And the Mardini sisters were reunited with their parents once they reached Berlin. Yesra continued her training and was selected to compete in Tokyo. She didn't win any medals, but she was appointed the youngest goodwill ambassador to the United Nations, and her swimming became the vehicle for her freedom. In our biblical text this morning, it was the woman's faith that became her vehicle for freedom. I can't imagine how difficult it would have been for her to make her way to the synagogue to worship each week. She couldn't see anything. She was in physical pain. She could barely hear the guest preacher that morning, but she was willing to make the trek, willing to endure the 
glances, willing to slowly make her way to the back of the synagogue where the women sat together. She wasn't welcome and she knew it. No one with an ailment was. But she came anyway because she wanted to worship God. How Jesus even spotted her was a miracle in and of itself, since she couldn't straighten her back. How could he even see her from the front of the room? But he did. And he calls to her, tells her she's been set free. And immediately, she begins praising God. She knew that she had been set free and there was only one person who could do that for her, and it was God. She could care less what anybody else thought of her. And the irony in this story is unmistakable. The religious leaders, so rigid in their ways, being knocked down from their self-made pedestal. And then this woman, who everyone shamed or avoided due to her ailment, is lifted up both physically and spiritually. And the leaders of the synagogue are dumbfounded. They know they had just lost an important argument about the Sabbath law, but the rest of the worshipers rejoice with this woman when she's been healed. They know that healing isn't just an outward act, but it comes from inside. It's an inward act too. The woman's transformed and through Jesus' witness, they're transformed too. But before we leave this story, I wonder if we shouldn't be asking ourselves, what is keeping us bent over? How are we impacted by the news, our colleagues, our family, our friends? How open are we to hearing how we might be weighed down by rules or laws? of our own making. Do we really want to liberate others or just ourselves? And that's at the question of this miracle this morning. It's a question that lies at the heart of the gospel. Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the truth is we're all captives. We're all captives to the voices we hear the messages we read to our financial and work and family obligations. If you ever read the book, The Ugly American, written in the 60s, Homer Atkins was an engineer who was physically unattractive, but was sent to Vietnam to build dams and roads for the military. But Homer refused to build them until the government first solved some of the problems faced by its people. At the suggestion of his wife, Emma, Homer decided to design a bicycle treadmill pump to transport water up the hillside to rice paddies on which the people depended for food. Until the time, all water had been carried by pails. But Emma noticed something else. Every woman over 60 had a bent back. And then she watched how after the monsoon season hit, the debris from the streets would be swept clear by older people. And they used brooms with short handles because the wood for, hand, for longer handles was too costly. So Emma decided to take matters into her own hands and she found a long stemmed reed and painted shoots from it tended them carefully and they began to flourish. One day she had neighbors over her house and she cut a tall reed and bound coconut fronds to the end of it and began to sweep with her back straight. People asked her where could they get the reeds? She showed them where she'd planted them and how they could cultivate them from then on. Four years later, Emma and Homer were back in Pittsburgh they received a letter from the head of the village thanking them. And in part, the letter read, in the village of Changdong today, the backs of our old people are straight and firm. No longer are the bodies of the elderly painfully bent. And on the outskirts of the village, there's a small shrine in your memory. At the foot are these words, in memory of the woman who unbent the backs of our people. 
it seems to me those very same words could have been inscribed on the cross. For by being lifted up on the cross for our sake, Jesus Christ unbent spiritually the backs of all people. And our calling is to keep straightening the backs of others, just as Homer and Emma did. Through our words of encouragement and our acts of compassion, may we do just that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, thanks be to God. Amen. to lead into prayer. <laughs> the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all goodness, your presence is with us in ways that are as obvious as a brilliant sunset and as subtle as a gentle rustle of the grass. Your faithfulness is never failing. Your steadfast love is unchanging. Give us the capacity to so dwell in your love that we're filled to overflowing. Where we're too proud to receive, O oh God, fix in us your humble dwelling and soften our rigidity of spirit. Where we are too fragile to receive, heal our broken dreams, relationships, bodies, and hearts. And Lord, we lift up to you now those among us who are struggling with cancer, with bodies that aren't cooperating, with pain that won't go away, with dashed hopes and dreams. In the silence of our hearts, we name them now 
and release them into your tender mercy and healing power. Whether we walk in the valley of the shadow of death or dance with joyous celebration, O oh God, your blessed presence sustains us. And for that gift of life made known to us in Jesus Christ, we are truly grateful. Reshape our experiences into wisdom, our pride into acceptance, our longing into trust that we might walk in the light of your truth and the warmth of your presence. And we pray that our leaders would as well, and all leaders around the globe, that the world might be a place where peace reigns and decisions are based on love, rather than on greed or fear or mistrust. And illumine the hearts of those who have turned away from you. Give compassion to those who no longer risk feeling at all and cultivate in all of us the desire to let you complete the work that you've begun in us, that we might live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we might serve you in perfect freedom and love. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now go with our Lord's benediction. May the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and in God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God, our Creator, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>